Hey there everybody, it's Mark Crilly. I'm back with another How to Draw video. This is part two in a two-part series showing uh, my approach to creating a full-color illustration. And uh, last week we did the pencils and inks, this week we're going to be doing all the coloring. Now the first thing I need to do is take this kneaded eraser and uh, get rid of all of the uh, penciled guidelines. I suppose you don't have to do this, but um, I would rather they be gone because once you uh, go on top with uh, marker or watercolor or whatever um, medium you choose, you are going to set that pencil, um, those lines, into the paper and they really can't be erased uh, at that stage. So, having got that out of the way, I am going to pull out a marker. I've decided to use markers um, as the base of my uh, coloring and then on top of that I'm going to work uh, with colored pencils. So this is a Prismacolor, uh, it's called Eggshell. Coquille d'oeuf. I hope I'm saying that right. I'm probably not saying that right. Uh, the French uh, <laughs> name for this color. It is a pretty kind of uh, shade of uh, yellow. And I'm going to use that as the base color of this robot all the way around. Now some people might be surprised. Why are you using markers? Mark. And I would say, you know, basically I think some people who watch my videos are not super comfortable using watercolors. They may not may not even own watercolors. Uh, and so I thought, let's uh, stick with uh, markers as my base color. I think um, a lot of people feel a little more comfortable with markers than they do with watercolor. I can certainly do another uh, video like this one uh, using watercolors next time. Uh, let me know in the comment section if you would like me to do that. But uh, for now you can see the pace at which I am uh, adding color. I am using the super thick uh, side of the marker naturally enough for covering these big, um, you know, relatively large areas. And um, I don't know if there's a whole lot more that I need to say. Um, with markers, a lot of times your goal is to try to hide the streakiness. Uh, you know, I was talking about this in my video about um, wood, making wooden surfaces that uh, markers can leave streaks and so forth. And um, wouldn't you know it, yet again I've <laughs> chosen a subject matter in which the streaks uh, are not a problem because this is a, a robot that's supposed to have an aged, rusted uh, surface. And so I'm not concerning myself too much with, uh, with concealing the streaks as I uh, color it in. But maybe that's about as much as I need to tell you about this part of the process in terms of putting down a base color. Let me go ahead and zip through the rest of this. Um, not the whole marker process, but just this one shade. Uh, and then I'll come back and uh, do some real time for some of the remaining marker work. Okay, well I thought of one thing that I could add uh, in terms of um, a tip here. I'm going back into the areas that uh, I intend to have shaded, uh, to have shadow on by the end of the illustration. And by going in a second time, you can get a slightly darker uh, shade of the same color. There's a limit to it. I mean, uh, with markers you can't uh, go, you know, it's not like you do a third layer and it gets darker and a fourth layer and it gets darker than that. Uh, it's, I, w I find basically you got the one layer effect um, and then basically the, the second layer is about as far as you can go towards getting a second shade out of the same marker. Correct me if I'm wrong, many of you uh, know your markers better than I do. And, but what, what ha tends to happen is you get, the, you, get, you get this initial dark shade and you're like, hey, whoa, look at that, I'm getting a darker shade. Then it dries and it tends to, uh, as it dries, it goes a little bit back towards that first color that you used. Anyway, a little uh, helpful tip there, hopefully. For those of you who get the most out of your markers, you can get a sort of a second shade out of the same marker by going in. Uh, for another layer. Now what I want to do uh, now is switch to a, a slightly different, well maybe noticeably different color, a darker brown. Now this is a touch marker from Sheen Han and uh, those of you who know my videos you won't be surprised that uh, instead of saying, instead of having one beautiful um, setup of lots of the exact same uh, marker like Copics or whatever. I have this hodgepodge ragtag assortment of different markers that I've collected over the years. I do not swear fealty to a single marker company. 
Um, I, uh, I find that um, I'm buying my markers according to the color. Uh, not so much the uh, manufacturer and, and uh, you know very often different art stores are carrying different markers and so anyway that's I don't use markers that much to begin with so I never got to the point of like oh it simply must be Copics I cannot tolerate any other markers yeah I never became like that I'm uh, I'm really just a little more haphazard in terms of hey there's that, that looks like a nice shade that's what I'll buy so you see me adding a kind of a secondary uh, color to this robot. Um, I guess I can say something about color choice here. Uh, I am a big fan of having what we call the limited palette, where you don't have um, you know every color of the rainbow. Uh, you make some choices early on about um, you know three or four main colors, let's say, and then you carry those colors throughout the piece. Or, you know, I designed this robot, he's kind of going to be a, a three-color robot. Uh, you know, this yellow-ish shade, this more ochre, brownish shade, and then I'm going to get some um, grays in there, and that'll be about it. That's just personal preference, um, but I do think that when you pull out every single color that you have, it does become a little bit like a rainbow and candy colored and um, to my eyes just um, not as pleasing uh, when there are too many colors vying for uh, the viewer's attention. I would rather just um, keep it simple and let one or two colors shine. So I'm going in here and, uh, and you know, I could have switched to a different marker here, certainly, but um, uh, I mean, another benefit to carrying the same colors throughout your entire illustration is that it ties it all together and m makes it a more unified piece. It holds together. Um, now, one thing I haven't really talked about that I probably should have uh, before now is uh, light source. Um, I have decided that there is a light source uh, to this uh, illustration uh, in, coming from the upper right, basically, and uh, so the darker sh shadows are falling on the lower uh, left. And maybe you can see me attempting to do the sort of, you know, one layer for the lighter areas over here and then going back in to darken things up to create that feeling of shadow. As I said, it's a little heartbreaking because sometimes you get that and you're like, oh, perfect, I'm getting that nice darker shade. And then it dries and it kind of uh, returns to a a lighter shade very close to that single layer shade that you began with. But, you know, it's worth at least getting something in there. And then a lot of this is going to be greatly enhanced when I go back in with the uh, colored pencils. In fact, I feel that the heavy lifting in this illustration is really going to be done by the colored pencils. Let's see if I can do maybe one last thing here. Um, I'm going to use a uh, well here. Let's uh, let's find a, a blue shade for her, um, you know, for her clothing. Okay, so I'm going in with uh, again a touch uh, marker to give her uh, sort of what would you call this jumpsuit or something. Um, a shade of blue. Now you'll notice that it, uh, I've chosen a, a contrast uh, in color from the color of the robot. I think that's probably the natural thing to do if I put her in a, a more uh, brown, uh, yellow colored clothing. She would kind of uh, blend in with the robot and uh, I just don't want that to happen and so I've chosen uh, this cooler uh, shade of uh, blue that will make her stand out. And, uh, which is not to say that none of the colors uh, that I use for her could be repeated uh, as, you know, colors from the robot design. In fact, I, I almost certainly will have some that uh, repeat. But uh, for the base color, the sort of big bold color that we first see when we look at her, I wanted something that would uh, offer pretty good contrast with the um, with the main color of the robot. I suppose I can also um, maybe take a moment here to do the flesh tones and maybe that'll be the last uh, thing that I do. This is a Pantone. This is quite an old marker. 
Pantone 475-T. I don't know if they even make these anymore, but uh, uh, every marker company is going to come up with a number of uh, flesh tones uh, that you can choose from, and uh, you will eventually find one that suits you. Uh, the one that you like best, not just one, but several perhaps that you like best. But notice that I'm also trying to do this effect of uh, adding darker shades on the lower left. I'm trying to do that consistently throughout the piece um, as much as possible with the markers. But as I said before, a lot of it is going to be achieved. Um, a lot of the real shading and toning and surface detail is all going to be done by way of uh, colored pencils. And I should say that if you like marker, or if you like watercolors, if you have me, maybe it's the opposite for you. Maybe you have watercolors, you don't have markers. All of this stuff that I'm doing with markers here uh, could be done with watercolors. Um, and my theory uh, is that uh, the putting down a base color with some sort of very smooth medium like uh, either uh, marker or watercolor it just gives you a, a single layer of color that's all unified and then the um, color pencil comes in on top of that. I'll talk about this more later on. Uh, but the problem with colored pencils is, is the color sometimes can be a little grainy. Uh, the, the white of the page tends to show through a little bit. So I always get a base layer down in, in something like watercolor or um, marker before I pull out the colored pencils. Well, I think it is time to kick it into time lapse to do some of the remaining base uh, watercolor work, and then we can come back and move on to the fun part of uh, adding the colored pencil. All right, well, I've got all the marker work done. Now I want to sort of zoom in a little bit and start doing some of the uh, colored pencil shading. All right, so I'm starting with a, um, a sort of darker shade of, uh, of a very similar color to the, this base yellowish uh, color I chose for the robot. And uh, I'm going in with very sort of gentle circular motions of the uh, pencil to gradually begin building up um, a bit of a, a shadow here on the left uh, hand side of his face. His? I don't know, this could be her. <laughs> Don't, hey, dude, don't assume that this is just because it's a robot, you think it's a guy, huh? What? Anyway, I am uh, just going to keep uh, adding, building up the shading uh, gradually. Um, you know, this kind of stuff, and the part of the reason why I tend to time elapse th through uh, the coloring is that it is uh, um, a time-consuming process. A lot of the changes uh, occur quite incrementally, and... Um, you, it's there's no drama really in terms of uh, watching the video, watching me very gradually build up this tone. But I think what I can do is maybe do um, a section of it, like this one section here, real time. Maybe do a um, a section uh, of her, uh, the female character's clothing or whatever. Do that real time, uh, and then uh, have to yeah inevitably time lapse through a bunch of it. But you can see how little by little, uh, with just a little you know, added pressure to the pencil. I'm gradually uh, gradually adding tone to this and uh, also uh, giving a bit of a texture, really, to the surface of the robot's head. Now, um, I want to uh, see what happens if I switch to a slightly different uh, color for indicating some of these rusted out areas. And uh, this color is maybe a closer, a little closer to this shade. This, um, to me, it looks like the uh, C-3PO, <laughs> the C-3PO shade. This whole character is beginning to look a little bit like C-3PO because of that coloring, I think. Um, but uh, yeah, you can see that you can take a break from building up shade to uh, adding a bit of detail. I think in a way, this kind of thing is more fun. Uh, both uh, as an illustrator and then also you know, for you watching the video, more interesting to see um, me adding detail stuff like this. Speaking of which, let's see if I can do a bit of that in terms of uh, pulling out the gray pencil to add a, a bit of added detail to this uh, interior area where you sort of, uh, the skin is uh, peeled away not peeled away, but 
there's a, a gap there that, that allows you to see some of the mechanics underneath the skin. Uh, going in here with just a slightly darker shade of gray, and then if that feels like it's not doing the job, we can always pull out the trusty black Prismacolor and uh, take it all the way to black in certain areas, although I do tend to hold off until the end of the process before I uh, start going for those really jet black tones. Just because you, it's hard to pull back on that if you change your mind later on, if you've started adding black right at the beginning. Um, just, yeah, go from going from light to dark is a, a tried and true method of doing this stuff. And maybe I'll just try one little final thing here. Switching to a, a slightly reddish uh, pencil. I have this idea of almost uh, rust streaks as if he's been out in the rain a lot. Um, and I, whenever I'm doing, when I'm trying to add a weathered kind of surface to something, I very often pull out this trick of the uh, sort of streaks of, I guess it's rust, oil, something, that's going down the face of the, uh, the robot. That combined with these more... Um, spot-like uh, details for me just uh, begins to suggest a, a real varied surface here that, that somehow just rings true to me as uh, something you might see in the real world. Well, I feel like you're getting an idea of how I go about doing this. Um, let's go ahead and, as I said, switch to coloring in uh, some of the female character and show uh, see if there's any differences in, in my approach over there. Okay, before I go into uh, coloring uh, the clothing, I think I will actually work on the flesh tone a little bit here because I did have people requesting advice on um, coloring uh, skin. Notice that I had that base color that was provided with um, marker, and now I'm taking a slightly darker peach kind of color and uh, uh, just working into the um, shaded areas on the left-hand side of her face. Um, and I would say just basically my advice with, um, with uh, coloring skin is to try to trade back and forth between different um, uh, pencils and, and sort of get a variety of different tones going on. So I'm pulling out more of a straight up pink here to go for the all important blushies. Don't want to get too carried away with this, but I'm adding just a little bit of um, uh, uh, pinkish tinge here to her cheeks. Now, I should point out that Prismacolor, the company that makes these colored pencils, makes two different types. One called the Very Thin, which is what I'm using right now, uh, Sanford. Very thin, and it's uh, the pencils are darker, or I mean, what am I saying? The, the, the lead is kind of harder. You have to push down more to uh, get the color to come off onto the page. It, it, it allows for more precision. Um, these other ones, like for example the one I was just using, is sort of the more standard Prismacolor Premier, I guess is what they call those. A little softer, and the um, color comes right off uh, very easily. You don't have to push down very hard, but you sort of give up a little bit in terms of precision. And I feel like I can even uh, switch over to a little bit of brown. See how dark brown this is? To uh, go for the shading underneath her uh, jaw and maybe just a little over here uh, on this far side of the face. So I suppose my best advice I can give you in terms of uh, adding shading to skin is to you know, mix it up, get a variety of different colors in there. Um, if you're using just two colors you're maybe not going to get um, a very three-dimensional uh, looking result. So, let's go on now and work a little bit on this uh, clothing. I'm pulling out again. This is one of the very thin ones, but it's a much darker uh, shade of blue. And uh, in keeping with my uh, light source, the, this darker shade is going to come over here on the uh, left-hand side of her arm. And again, sort of circular motions. I think I'm being much more controlled here. The area of her arm is smaller than that of the robot uh, face, and so um, I'm kind of taking my time and using tighter little circles 
to gradually build up uh, a bit of tone. But I suppose what I will get to uh, over here is this um, idea of the wrinkles and maybe um, darkening them in rather more uh, dramatically to to add the uh, suggestion of uh, actual wrinkles in the surface of the clothing. So you've got a kind of com combined effect here of a, of a lighter tone that's really just the shading, uh, uh, a gradient uh, change of color, and then every once in a while I'm switching to actually, uh, well, over here I guess I could show, uh, using this as a more precise tool for revealing wrinkles uh, in the cloth. And, as I said with the uh, skin color, the more different uh, shades that you can blend into a single area, the better. In fact, I'm going to just, for the fun of it, pull to this um, ultramarine kind of uh, prisma color that is uh, much more uh, purplish, purpley. Um, just to show you that when you begin blending together different uh, colors, it just makes it more interesting and, and makes it more solid looking in the end, I think. The more different colors you can mix in there. Sometimes I'm even mixing in weirdly different colors, like, uh, you know, orange or something into the blue, just to give it lots of variety. But this, you can see, very tentative, my approach here. I'm just very, very gradually uh, building things up here. And uh, that's probably about as much as I can say about that. I mean, I'll, let me tr try one last thing over here, and that is with her hair. Uh, I can start to talk about shading that in. In a way, I'm shading the gaps between the hair uh, rather than the hair itself here. I'm uh, focusing on the darker areas where the, the light will not be reaching. And uh, the final step in my coloring process Surprise, surprise, is going to be the white gouache. Everyone knows I'm addicted to the gouache. Uh, but that's going to help add uh, shininess uh, to her hair, to um, the sort of jump suit that she's wearing. Uh, and then a little bit. I don't want the robot to look too shiny, but I'm going to also be using that a little... Uh, using a little white gouache on the surface of the robot should be able to achieve some nice effects there at the end um, in terms of making that surface look more solid. And maybe that does it for this. As you can see, I could spend a whole other hour talking to you about uh, adding shading. It is a very gradual process and does not lend itself to uh, a single real-time video. I mean, uh, I guess it's maybe time for me to do one of those real-time challenges like I did last year. We had four different videos that combined to be something like two hours or something to, to show you how long this stuff really takes. Anyway, I think I'm ready then to move on to some time-lapse photography as I uh, continue using uh, colored pencils to um, uh, add to the color throughout the piece. And maybe I can come back and um, uh, maybe do a little bit of real-time stuff towards the end just before we move uh, to the gouache. Okay, well, the truth is I could continue working on this um, for even more <laughs> time to, uh, you know, further refine it, but I feel like it's time to start moving on to that final stage with the white gouache. Uh, I did want to say a word or two about uh, some of the techniques that I used here. You know, even though the base color is in uh, marker and then I move on to colored pencil, that doesn't mean that I'm done with marker uh, at that stage. Uh, periodically I will... Uh, return and pull out a, a little bit of uh, marker and, you know, just to sort of show you, um, add further things to it. In fact, sometimes it mixes with the colored pencil a little, and um, if you don't mind that, it can sort of add a different effect. So, yeah, just to let you know that it's not, uh, there's no, no harm with going back. In fact, you almost certainly will see things that you want to uh, further refine uh, with the marker even after you have reached this uh, 
this penciling stage. So anyway, I'm going to go ahead and grab my white gouache and then we're going to add some uh, highlights and that's probably going to be the end of it. Okay, so I've got my white gouache here and uh, I'm going to begin applying uh, a little bit here and there with the uh, brush uh, and you know like I said I didn't want to get too much uh, on this robot I think really the robot is supposed to be kind of rusted out and old looking but I thought certain parts of it could benefit actually let me uh, refocus a little so that you can see the details of what I'm doing here alright so this can be a pretty effective little trick here for uh, rendering the surface of the robots the sort of uh, metallic skin if you know your light source coming from the right and have decided that um, all the shadows are on the left, then you also can get just a little glint of uh, white light. It's almost like a, the effect of paint having chipped away uh, in certain areas. And I find that this can be a great way of suddenly um, solidifying, making the surface look more solid. Um, don't know if that effect is showing up, but I've been using this one for years. It's a nifty little trick and uh, in a way, to be honest with you, this whole concept of doing the <laughs> the robot, uh, I sort of had this in the back of my mind from the beginning. I'm like, all right, yeah, if I have a, if a large part of this illustration is taken up with the surface of a robot's metallic skin, then uh, we can do this technique with the white gouache. Of course people have you know, who've been watching my videos are like, oh, Krilly, you're always using white gouache. Dude, man, what is it with you and the white gouache? Can't you go one video without it? Uh, and I'm, I'm sure I've gone at least one <laughs> without it by now. Um, but I thought uh, for this one, for sure, a um, about, you know, doing a full color illustration, it would basically be dishonest for me to do this video without white gouache because I would definitely uh, be using it for an illustration like this, you know, if it were uh, intended for publication. Um, well, let's see here. I think I, if I refocus the camera one more time, I can maybe uh, show some white gouache techniques uh, uh, on the female character, and then we'll be able to wind the video down. I wanted to definitely get a little bit of uh, highlight going on her hair here. Uh, again, you have to stay focused on the light source remembering where the light is coming from so that you can be uh, consistent with that. I'm just, I'm kind of creating the sense of a, a line, a strip of white highlight that goes across her hair, but making it get a little thicker over here, closer uh, to the light. And then I also wanted to um, get a bunch of highlights over here on this uh, this drill that she's using, I thought that could make it look uh, much more metallic. And uh, yeah, you know, it's funny, I've, I guess I've taught this technique a number of times now with the white gouache, but uh, it I never really get tired <laughs> of... Because it is, you know, I talk about what looks dramatic on video and what doesn't. I think white gouache definitely you immediately get a result, right? It's not this incremental thing. You just drop it in there and boom, you know, wow, hey, look, that looks more metallic than it did about three seconds ago. So uh, that certainly uh, uh, is a nice aspect that I don't have to time lapse this part. Uh, but speaking of which, I probably will <laughs> time lapse bits of it. Um, but you can see how, uh, like if I decide that her uh, her jumpsuit thing here is made out of uh, leather, uh, then that sort of justifies making it uh, shiny looking. And even if you're very careful along the uh, seam here, you can add a little extra, or like on these wrinkles, you know, you can get a little extra shine on there and then uh, suddenly her clothing begins to look more uh, like it's made of leather or some space age nylon, <laughs> something like that. Anyway, I am gonna have to sadly uh, do a little time lapse to uh, finish up the um, gouache stage and then we'll be able to wind this uh, video down with a few final words.
All right, well, there's my second uh, in the two-part video series showing my entire illustration process from beginning to end. Let me know what you thought about this, uh, especially the idea of uh, breaking it into two parts. I don't do that so often, but uh, for certain topics, I think it really does help for uh, covering the entire process thoroughly. But for now, let me go ahead and thank anyone who has supported me by getting any of my books. We got Brody's Ghost and Miki Falls, my graphic novel series, as well as Mastering Manga 1 and Mastering Manga 2. To my how to draw books. I really do deeply appreciate the support of those uh, who helped me out by getting those books. Uh, but for now, let's go ahead and lay down this pencil. I really hope you enjoyed this video. Thanks for watching it, and I'll be back with another one real soon.